Okay, my name is David Jacobson. I'm the director of the program of Judaic Studies. And I want to welcome you to this very special event at Brown. This conversation with David Mikoski and Reith Al Omari is being dedicated to the memory of Avi Schaefer, Brown class of 2013. The Brown community continues to mourn his tragic death, and our hearts go out to the families, to the members of his family. His grandparents, his parents, Arthur and Laurie Gross Schaefer, and his brothers, <clears throat> Alicia, Yov, and Noah. Alicia and his friend, Jen Raskoff, are with us tonight, representing Avi's family, and I want to extend to them a very warm welcome to uh, Brown University. Turn off yourself. <laughs> As many of you know, <clears throat> Avi, uh, who grew up in America but decided after graduating high school to serve in the Israel Defense Forces together with his brother Yoav, his twin brother Yoav, and Sami. Jarbawi, a Palestinian undergraduate, and I formed a partnership last fall. Our goal was to move the discussion of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict at Brown beyond the polarizing effects of advocates of both sides talking at each other. We committed ourselves to work toward the development on campus of a more sophisticated, open-minded consideration of the aspirations of both Israelis and Palestinians for national self-determination and for peace. Avi captured the essence of our vision in an opinion piece he published in the Brown Daily Herald last November. He wrote, when both sides truly understand that Israelis and Palestinians have a right to live, a need for legitimate safety, and a desire to envision a more peaceful future for their children, then there will be peace. Can we move past the nuances to work together? Can we understand each other in order to help both Israelis and Palestinians realize the other side's story? If we at Brown cannot create a forum to understand each other, how can we ever assume that this will be created in the Middle East? This evening's conversation is the first of what I hope will be many efforts at Brown to transcend the limited perspective of political ideologies and to seek to understand the nature of this conflict in a way that honors the passions of both peoples and seeks to bridge the gaps between them. I want to express my gratitude to the sponsors of this event, the Program of Judaic Studies, Middle East Studies, Common Ground, Justice and Equality in Palestine, Israel, Puzzle Peace, Brown Students for Israel, and the Israel on Campus Coalition. And before I proceed, I have two commercial announcements of two events that may be of interest to you coming up related to our uh, conversation tonight. Tomorrow, March 11th, Common Ground will host the second screening in the 2010 Providence Palestinian film series. It will be an evening of short films featuring the recent work of three independent filmmakers as well as one Brown student, Ali al -Laulu. The topics of these films range from the Black Panther movement among Moroccan Jews in Israel to a documentary shot in Gaza one month after Operation Cast Lead. And Ali al -Laulu and Bassam Jabarwi, who's director of the short award-winning film, will be present to introduce their films and will discuss their work during an audience question and answer sessions after the screenings. That will be tomorrow night at 8 o'clock in Solomon 001. The event is free and open to the public. And next Monday, March 15th, the program of Judaic Studies will present the annual Elga K. Stolman Visiting Scholar Lecture. The title will be Revisiting Exile, Zionism, Cultural Diversity, and the Politics of Identity in Israel by Professor Yael Zrubavel of Rutgers University. And that event will be Monday night, 8 p.m. in Smith Bonano, 106, and it too is free and open to the public. Our format will be as follows. For about 30 minutes or so, I will ask our guests a series of questions about why the stalemate between the Palestinians and the Israelis has been so prolonged and what paths toward peace between these two peoples they could envision. These questions are based on questions submitted by students in the three Brown student groups co-sponsoring the event, Common Ground, um, uh, Puzzle Peace, and Brown Students for Israel, and they include some of my own questions as well. 
For the remaining time until 9 o'clock, we will entertain questions from the audience. Uh, when I give the signal, um, we ask you to uh, line up on either one of these two mics, and we'll try to take as many questions as we can. Following the panel discussion, the members of the sponsoring student groups are invited to a private meeting with our panelists in this building in Macmillan Room 115. Let me introduce our guests now. To my left, David Mikoski is the Ziegler Distinguished Fellow and Director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy Project on the Middle East Peace Process. He is an adjunct lecturer in Middle Eastern Studies at Johns Hopkins University's Paul H. Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies, and he is the co-author with Dennis Ross of the 2009 book, Myths, Illusions, and Peace, Finding a New Direction in the Middle East. Mr. Mikoski is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the London-based International Institute for Strategic Studies. His commentary on the peace process and the Arab-Israeli conflict has appeared in leading newspapers and journals. Before joining the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, Mr. Mikoski was an award-winning journalist who covered the Arab-Israeli peace process from 1989 to 2000. He is the former executive editor of the Jerusalem Post and was diplomatic correspondent for Israel's leading daily, Haaretz. Now a contributing editor to U.S. News and World Report, he served for 11 years as the magazine's special Jerusalem correspondent. Nureh al-Omari is advocacy director of the American Task Force on Palestine. Prior to that, he served in various positions within the Palestinian Authority, including director of the International Relations Department in the office of the Palestinian president and advisor to Mahmoud Abbas when he was prime minister of the authority. In these capacities, he provided advice on foreign policy, especially vis-a-vis -vis the United States and Israel, and security. He has extensive experience in the Palestinian-Israeli peace process, having been an advisor to the Palestinian negotiating team throughout the permanent status negotiations from 1999 to 2001. In that capacity, he participated in various negotiating rounds, most notably the Camp David summit and the Taba talks. After the breakdown of the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations, he was the lead Palestinian drafter of the Geneva Initiative, an unofficial model peace agreement negotiated between leading Palestinian and Israeli public figures. Mr. Alomari is a lawyer by training and a graduate of Georgetown and Oxford Universities. Prior to his involvement in the Middle East peace process, he taught international law in Jordan and was active in human rights advocacy. And now, my first question. And you can decide whoever wants to take it first. My first question is, how would you assess the leadership of the three political entities at the heart of the conflict? Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel, President Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, and Prime Minister Salam Fayyad of the Palestinian Authority of the West Bank, and the Hamas leadership. How committed would you say these leaders are to a peaceful resolution of the conflict? How have these leaders' actions constituted obstacles to a resolution of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? To what extent have these leaders contributed to moving the two sides closer to peace? And to what extent do political divisions among Israelis and the political division between the Palestinian Authority and the West Bank and Hamas and the, and the Gaza Strip make it difficult for either side to negotiate. <laughs> okay, and I'll try to answer that in maybe two minutes. <laughs> or less. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for getting me out of Washington, which is always a pleasure. Um, it's really, I mean, humbling to be here at the memory of Avi. I've never known him, but uh, Sami Jorbawi uh, told me a lot about him. I read a lot of, about him, and I was looking forward to meeting him. But I think it's really a fitting tribute to him. The fact that, as I understand it, this is the first event that's co-sponsored by pro-Israel and pro-Palestinian groups on this campus. And that, I think, is the model that we all should be striving for. And I'm really, honestly, humbled, humbled to uh, be part of this. Now, as to the very easy question that was posed, um, let, me start, let me start with one, uh, one word. Is I, will not, I will not try to address the issue of intentions for two reasons. First of all, we don't know the intentions of the leaders. Most of those leaders are very secretive. Very few people know what they really think. But more importantly, as the history of the region shows us, intention is at some point irrelevant. When Rabin became prime minister, he was not planning to uh, sign Oslo. When Sharon was prime minister, became prime minister, he was not planning to go out of Gaza. When Sadat became president, he was not planning to travel to Jerusalem. So intention often is less important than uh, the political realities and the political dynamics that shape political behavior. 
So I'll give a, a very brief, under, my understanding of the political questions facing the four players that were mentioned. In terms of uh, Bibi Netanyahu, again, Bibi is a, he's, a, he's an enigma. There is the Bibi who obviously is pushing for peace. There's the Bibi of the 90s that we don't, we don't know where he is. But Bibi, no matter what it is, he is a hostage to his political reality. A political reality that was shaped over the last eight years, 10 years of active conflict by mutual uh, recrimination with Palestinians and Israelis, by political discourse shifting more and more, uh, becoming more and more hardline, and more recently by a coalition that he created that is very much not committed to moving towards peace. He has so far done all of the right moves in terms of accepting the two-state solution, engaging in the negotiations, but his ability to move is very much based on his political landscape, domestic one, and in his, uh, his coalition. And I think his ability to move forward very quickly on a peace process will be limited until he manages to uh, modify these two uh, variables. And modifying political uh, landscapes uh, is a time-consuming process, and changing a coalition in Israel is a complicated process. So I don't see him being able to have any breakthroughs in the short term. Equally, when it comes to Abbas, he's in a very similar position. Years of active conflict with Israel, years where the public discourse has been uh, to the best, you know, to say diplomatically toxic in that region. Um, having come from a very, having just survived a very tough political uh, phase after the, uh, the publication of a UN report regarding the war in Gaza, and I must say the Palestinians mishandled the way they dealt with it, he feels isolated, he feels weakened, he feels at this stage that he himself needs to, first of all, change his public space by starting to introduce a new kind of discourse that will uh, reverse the discourse of the last 10 years. But also, he's not willing, in my view, to take any major risks at this point without assurances that these risks will be supported by the Arab world, on the one hand, by a strong American administration, on the other hand, and frankly, by his own political party. So I see him engaging in a negotiation but I will see him moving towards that negotiation quite cautiously. Um, which really, I mean, the sum of these two things means that while I'm positive that the negotiations are going to resume despite the setback that we had yesterday, I'm not so sure that we're going to have any breakthroughs in the short term. It doesn't mean that we don't need negotiations. We definitely need them for two reasons. <coughs> One reason is having a negotiation, having a political framework <coughs> for action will allow the Palestinians and the Israelis to do things on the ground that are essential for moving forward. It will frame things that need to be done on the ground. But in a, political, uh, in a more political sense, today for Netanyahu and for Abbas, getting into the negotiations has been a costly process. It's one that they do not own. It's a process that has to be in some ways forced on them. Two, three, four months after being engaged in negotiations, the process becomes theirs. The success of the process or the failure of the process becomes the success or failure of the leaders who are identified with it. So both leaders will have a political logic for working, I think, more vigorously and robustly towards the success of this process. So it creates its own political dynamic. The third player that you mentioned is uh, Salam Fayyad, the Palestinian prime minister. For those who, of you who don't know him, he has not been part of the traditional Palestinian scene. He's an economist, IMF, World Bank guy who... Uh, somehow landed the job of prime minister. Well, I mean, it's a long story, but uh, this is where he is. He's a very interesting phenomenon in Palestinian uh, political culture. He is a leader who has come and said, look, the occupation is bad. We're suffering under occupation. We know all of this. There's nothing new to add to this discourse. But the one thing that's been missing in the Palestinian political discourse mm -hmm. is a Palestinian leader who says, I'm actually going to stop blaming others, and I'm going to take control of what I can do. There is still, under occupation, there is a space <clears throat> that I can still move in and build within. He started the project of improving or rebuilding the security sector, which was very successful, A, in restoring public uh, order and law and order in, uh, among the Palestinian areas, but B, in also re-establishing uh, effective counterterrorism and re-establishing working relations, deep working relations with, uh, and cooperation with the Israeli security establishment. Now, two years after this project, the biggest advocate, I would say, for Palestinians in the Israeli system is the IDF, the Israeli uh, military. 
and the Israeli security establishment. And now he is moving towards building, replicating this model in other sectors, health, education, governance, etc., etc. The reason I mentioned that is even though I don't see the possibility of a breakthrough in the short term in the big process because the political reality is facing uh, Abbas and Netanyahu, I see a lot of space for progress on building the institutions of statehood for the Palestinians in a way that will create a dynamic and will start shifting that discourse that we have had for the last years. Finally, a word on Hamas. I simply do not see Hamas as having any interest in peace. Hamas's uh, rise to power is direct. There's a direct causality between Hamas's increased popularity and the failure of the peace process. Obviously, the rise of Hamas has been uh, contributed to by the mismanagement and corruption of the Palestinian Authority. But to a large extent, their uh, legitimacy comes from saying, <laughs> negotiations don't pay. It's violence that gets us what we need. Hamas has no political interest as such in negotiations, and as a matter of fact, a successful peace process is a, will weaken Hamas, and they know that. And they will always be a spoiler. There is talk that we want Hamas, we should bring Hamas into the game through a national unity arrangement where they become you know, brought into the process and they're no longer spoilers. They have not acted in a way so far to seem that they, to indicate that they're interested in that. They continue to use Gaza as a base for uh, violence and for continuing terrorism. And they still refuse to accept the basic rules of the game. While Hamas did win an election very democratically, and there is no two ways about it, democracy is known about elections. Democracy is also playing the rules of the democratic game, which basically consists in international relations. First of all, accepting the two-state solution, which Hamas is still to uh, accept. Rescinding violence, renouncing violence, and accepting that you can get your goals through uh, political means and no longer through violence and terrorism. And finally, accepting and respecting previous agreements. They refuse to recognize all of these. And until they do, I think engaging Hamas as a legitimate player is a very dangerous game, both in terms of the way that it uh, devalues the whole negotiation paradigm, but also on a regional level. Islamist organizations, particularly the Muslim Brotherhood, in Jordan and Egypt are becoming, are taking a more hard line position more recently. And they're sitting and watching. If the message that we send is, it's okay to mount a coup, it's okay to engage in terrorism, you hold fast for a couple of years and the world will recognize you, then this, what this will do to the stability of Jordan and Egypt, which are key US allies, is gonna be dangerous. So Hamas is the one player that at this stage, I do not see as a player in the peace process, but a, but a part that has to be contained. Once there is a vibrant peace process, then they will have to face a choice. Are they join that train or have to explain to their own public why are they stumbling block towards creating a Palestinian state? Before that, I just don't see them moving anywhere. Okay, <clears throat> well, um, thank you, Professor Jacobson, for having us. And uh, I'd like to um, also express my um, condolences to Avi's family, uh, the members who were here and others. I think it's a supreme tribute uh, that in, in his memory, we're trying to have a dialogue here that will hopefully shed more uh, light than heat. Um, the fact that Wraith and I are going across the country to campuses, really it's based on Brown. Um, it's not known. I was spoke here uh, about four years ago, or I don't know, and uh, I, I was on here with a fellow named Amchad Atala, and it just got me thinking that this is, this is the way to do it, to create, even where there's differences, if people see that the differences are narrow and people could have more rational, uh, a more rational discourse, maybe this would be our small contribution to de, you know, depolarize, if you will, if there's such a phrase, the campuses. So if this is a small contribution in, in memory of Avi, then I'm, I'm deeply honored uh, to be here with you this evening. And I thank uh, Dr. Jacobson for hosting us and for giving really the idea that we're now taking across the country. We were just at the University of Chicago a couple weeks ago, and we'll be going to a bunch of schools. We were on the West Coast um, last semester. Um, look, in terms of the question, uh, yes, we're kind of at the end of the heroic phase of, of the Arab-Israeli conflict. There's no Anwar Sadat or Yitzhak Rabin, for that matter, who is taking a leap into the unknown. Uh, there's no such leader who is willing to throw political calculus to the wind, so to speak, and uh, just see where the chips lie. Um, these are two uh, careful people, and you know we could be depressed about that, that there is no Sadat or no Rabin, 
But the fact is that, that Netanyahu, by bringing the center-right uh, over and saying we need a Palestinian state and this is in Israel's interest too, this is something I think that would have been unthinkable uh, several years ago. Um, and I think that's important. And I think in terms of Abbas, uh, also some of the things being done about violence is also something that I don't think we could have imagined years ago during the Arafat era. So while it's very trendy to be depressed about the Middle East, if you tell anybody good news, you know, you think you've ruined their day, I apologize if I've ruined your day, but there is actually some good news out there, is that there are constituencies here that are now being brought to the table that, uh, you know, that, are, that, were, not, that were not engaged before. Um, and uh, I would say with Netanyahu, yes, if, if I was, you know, trying to look for metrics or, you know, or look for signals of, of where is negotiations entering a new phase, I would say if he brings Tsipi Livni of the Kadima party into his government, and here there's a question of who do you believe, uh, he says he's trying and Tsipi's resisting, and she's saying, well, when they're at the decision-making phase on a two-state solution, we're there. So that will be a metric that, or a sign that he is, uh, the broadening of the government is that hard decisions are about to be made. And in terms of Abbas, I think uh, here too, there's been, uh, you know, this is a new phenomenon, some part good and part, you know, can be a little nervous about, that for the first time that uh, he's asking for Arab League approval uh, to come to the table. And, you know, you could look at these talks that Senator Mitchell announced this week and say, it's a step backward. I mean, proximity talks, shuttling between the sides. Didn't we have the Madrid Conference of 1991, where Israelis and Palestinians are sitting together? Why do you need a mediator to shuttle between them? You could say that's a step back. But you've also had the Arab League now saying, yeah, go for it for four months and see how it goes. So on one hand, they are giving him political cover. Uh, on the other hand, you know, one of the achievements actually of Arafat is the way that the Palestinians were independent actors on the regional stage that they maneuvered regardless of the Arabs. Uh, so you don't want a situation that the Arabs have to give somehow permission at every phase of this. And that will create its own veto lowest common denominator. But I do think that uh, both, uh, you know, that Abbas uh, also uh, realizes that um, and both sides realize that if they don't make progress, the radicals win. I mean, that you have a situation that of Hamas waiting in the wings, waiting for the pragmatists to fall, so to speak, and be discredited and have the negotiating paradigm discredited. And in the case of Israel, you've got demographic challenges that if you don't get towards a two-state solution, people will be talking about other things that are not to Israel's liking. So each side, I think, has internal drivers. I think it would be wrong to say it's all about American pressure. There's domestic uh, uh, challenges that propel these parties to, to try to, to reach an agreement. Now, I agree also with Raith on, on Fayyad. If there's any fascinating new development, it's kind of ironic that it's coming from someone who's, who was originally an accountant, but uh, Salam Fayyad, who was an accountant, then he went on to get a degree and PhD in economics. Uh, this is a new paradigm shift. I think the Arafat model was entitlement, that you know, we're occupied and therefore we're responsible for nothing and we're entitled to everything. And I think the Fayyad approach is we can't just talk about bottom-down negotiations. We've got to have, you know, bottom-up, uh, you know, we can't just have top-down negotiations. We need bottom-up institution building. And it's about what we do as Palestinians. And that might sound obvious. Well, of course, if you're going to build a state, you need institutions. But uh, Fayyad has spoken, uh, he told George Bush when he came for Israel's 60th birthday last year, he said, look, look what they did, the Zionists. They built that state uh, from 1917 when the Balfour Declaration to 48 when they declared it. By the time they declared it, they had already built the state because they had built the institutions. And, and that is, is fascinating, this new focus on accountability. Wraith mentioned the security cooperation. Um, there's, there's economic growth. I'm not here trying to, to say there's not economic problems. It is an occupation, and, and, uh, and, but it has to be solved. And that's why these negotiations are underway. 
And, um, you know, I think it might be invoked to dismiss them. Oh, nothing's going to happen. It's a waste of time. But I do think there are domestic uh, pressures on these parties that, whether it's in the current configuration or a new coalition configurations, uh, they will face these same challenges. And they, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm somewhat hopeful. I, we're not in the heroic phase that we, we you know, we weren't in the past. But I think we're in a very sober phase, and uh, it's one we need to follow very seriously. Okay, let me ask you both about um, uh, the Obama administration and its involvement. We actually have, by coincidence, uh, Joe Biden is Vice President Joe Biden is in uh, Israel Palestine right now, um, and uh, I'm wondering how you rate the Obama administration's efforts to bring peace so far, um, and how would you compare them to President Obama's immediate uh, predecessors, uh, Bill Clinton and George Bush? Um, I mean, let me start with a kind of general uh, comment. Uh, I believe that the Arab-Israeli conflict will not be resolved without the U.S. A U.S. role is essential, it is central, it is indispensable for resolving that conflict. Um, often when I speak especially to uh, pro-Palestinian groups, the question that I always get asked, yes, but uh, isn't the, is the U.S. an honest broker? My answer is, well, you know, honest is a matter of perspective. Uh, uh, we all know that uh, Israeli-American relations are unique. And ultimately, uh, when push comes to shove, Israel's interests are paramount for the United States. But the question is not whether or not whether, uh, you need an honest broker. The question is, do you need an effective broker? Because ultimately, you might get someone who can sympathize with you, but it's totally ineffective. The only player that can be an effective uh, uh, broker in this conflict is the U.S., specifically because of the special relation that it has with Israel. At the end of the day, the various players, Israel, the Palestinians, will be asked to make some very risky moves. will have to, uh, to, as David put it, jump into the unknown. And they need reassurances. And they need to be accompanied by parties they trust. And for Israel, the only party that Israel trusts, that has confidence in, is the U.S. So in that regard, the U.S. is indispensable. People talk about pressure. I think that's a counterproductive approach. I think ultimately, the stronger the ties between the Israel and the United States, the more willing Israel is to move uh, forward on things. Now, that said, um, in terms of the Obama administration, I mean, I will not compare administrations. Each administration had its own uh, high point. Uh, Clinton brought this into the limelight, Bush was the first American president to recognize the two-state solution, and now we have Obama. I think, I mean, it's easy to sit and uh, say where they went wrong, and there are many places they went wrong. But I would say the following. When the Obama administration came into power, they had, an op they had to make a choice. Either wait back a little bit, assess, study, examine, come up with plans, and plan A and B and C and what have you, and take their time doing it. And as they take their time, things on the ground will continue slipping backwards, as is the case always there in the Middle East. Either there's movement forward or backwards. Things don't stay still. That was one choice, and that would have been the, you know, the cautious choice. The other choice was actually plunge in from day one and get involved in this and see where you go with it. Yes, you don't have your plans fully formulated. Yes, you're going to go through stumbling blocks along the way. Ultimately, uh, though, the sense was get involved and stop things from deteriorating. And I must say that's what happened. Obama came at a time when the relations between Palestinians and Israelis were probably at their worst in many years after the Gaza war. And I think the Obama involvement and the fact that he, the first act that he did in the Oval Office, the very first one, 8.45 AM on the 21st, was called uh, Abbas, was indicative that the US does not want this to uh, go any further. We have someone like George Mitchell, who is someone who has political gravitas and who has a proven track record. More importantly, what we have in Washington, which is very new, very, very new, is a Congress that is willing to support the president on this, which has not been the case throughout uh, during the Clinton era and I would say during even the Bush era. And the other thing that we have in, the, in Washington, at least, which is very interesting, that plays into in, uh, empowering the Obama administration is if you wish, the mainstream, the establishment of Jewish American opinion and Arab American opinion willing to work together with an understanding that two-state solution is in the interest, A, of the two parties that they feel related to, but more importantly, of this country. So 
I see from Obama, yes, there were stumbling, uh, there were some false starts, but I see determination. Nothing that I see from talking to that administration that indicates to me that they're faltering. Despite all the disappointments that they're having and all of their complaints about the Palestinians and the Israelis, they're not letting this one go. Yeah, I agree with that, that they don't, uh, I think their basic, their motivation is, has been positive. I guess I should say a disclaimer from the start that my co-author, Dennis Ross, is now joined the Obama administration, in case people ask. Uh, I personally think if they would have brought him to the White House a little earlier, a lot of those stumbling blocks that they encountered, they wouldn't have faced. That's my own private view. But um, while I think their motivation is positive, and, and Wraith is right to talk about the symbolism, you know, the first phone call, uh, George Mitchell was announced the second day of the Obama administration. Um, there's a clearly uh, a commitment here to try to make it happen. But I, I think, look at the president's own words in the interview with Time Magazine uh, with Joe Klein on his first year in office, where he said, look, I, you know, basically we miscalculated. And I think that in many ways, even though you could say the best of intentions, there was a miscalculation. In a certain way, we're kind of in the shadow of that miscalculation. We're kind of in the ditch um, uh, from those early days. The fact that this week they actually have peace talks announced is good, but I don't think any of us would have predicted that you have an Obama administration that wants peace talks and it would take it over a year uh, to get the parties to the table. And even uh, being at the table, they're not at the exact same table because they have to, there's someone shuttling between them. So what went wrong? And I think they've, they've corrected it. Um, so I don't think it's because they're hostile to one party or another. I just, th I don't think they knew the issue as well as they thought they knew it. Um, I think the mistake was uh, raising the bar too high. I realize people here may disagree, uh, but I think they raised the bar high on the settlements issue in a way that was counterproductive. Uh, you could have gotten the exact same results by framing it differently and saying, look, we don't want you to expand settlements because we don't want to prejudge the outcome of negotiations. And I think we wouldn't have been in the situation we're in now. But if you look at some of the interviews that Abbas has done in Ashark al-Assad and Der Spiegel, where he said, look, I was in a box, basically, that the Obama administration called for a freeze. How can they call for a freeze and I not endorse the freeze? I mean, basically, Abbas could not be less uh, pro-Palestinian than the United States. And uh, that, that cornered him uh, because it created a situation that Abbas couldn't accept less. Uh, then, um, so, in, I mean, to most students at Brown, it'll sound like, isn't this semantics? What's the difference? You don't expand, you don't freeze, isn't that the same thing? But the truth was there was a world of difference here uh, because it, it was to the point that it was impractical and being in Israel in the summer and going to Ramallah, I didn't hear anyone echoing Obama and saying, say yes to Obama. It was, um, I think, by misframing the issue, um, it, it enabled uh, uh, people to, to say, does he really know this issue well enough? And it boxed the boss in. In the end, it, you know, Obama reached an, an understanding with Netanyahu on the shape of, of the settlement moratorium, which is more about, I think, expansion than any, you know, not expanding than anything else. But it was short of a full-fledged freeze. And the Arab states who wanted, who said, we want a full-fledged freeze at 100 percent, they got an Israeli settlement, a qualified settlement moratorium that was maybe 80 percent of what they wanted. But they then said, OK, George Mitchell, we said we would twin it, but they didn't do 100%, so we'll do 0%. Well, that doesn't exactly build support for your ideas if the Arab states don't come behind them. So I feel that by setting the bar too high, we lost both sides. We lost the Israeli public, and we lost uh, the Abbas because he was out on the limb. And the proximity talks, in a certain way, is the ladder to climb down from that limb. So. You know, here we are. We are where we are. Again, I don't think it's out of malice of the administration, but I think it was just a miscalculation. And, and I think, oh, you know, Obama has said it himself that he miscalculated. And I'm hopeful that the administration has better success uh, for the remainder of its term. And frankly, I'm very pleased that it has prioritized this issue. Okay, there are many issues that divide the Palestinians and the Israelis. 
borders, Jewish settlements, Palestinian refugees, status of Jerusalem, security arrangements, recognizing each other's national legitimacy of each other's national identity. Does everything have to be solved all at once, as has been an assumption at some times? Or is it actually possible to do this step by step, solving part of the problem, leaving other things aside? Um, so I'm just curious. Uh, yeah, I'll start on this one. Okay. This is kind of my favorite issue. So um, um, look, when I said about that we're not in the Sadat uh, and, and, and Rabin uh, uh, leadership phase of this conflict, what I, what, what's missing here is uh, leaders on both sides that are willing to be several steps ahead of their people and are systematically conditioning the societal landscape uh, for the changes they want. And I see two of the four issues of this conflict are what I would call the narrative issues, Jerusalem and refugees. Uh, Jerusalem is an issue that is intertwined religiously and uh, in terms of the, of the nationalist uh, dimension of each side and uh, relate to the self-definition of the parties. Um, and, and the refugee issue is that certainly also for the Palestinians. Uh, I don't see either leader conditioning uh, the societal landscape towards accommodation uh, and breakthrough. Uh, now, we could all be very despairing about this and saying, oh, well, there's no hope. I think, though, ironically, and this might be a, a surprise for college students, but I think, ironically, the issue of land that you know, many think is the core of the conflict, I think is the most, I want to say easy is, is not the right word, but it's the most amenable to resolution at this time. And the fourth uh, issue is security, which basically goes with the land issue. Um, and to me, Olmert, the former Prime Minister of Israel, and Abbas were only four percentage points apart on how they envisaged uh, an outcome on the land. And each admitted, each admitted that there would be what we call offsets or swaps, land swaps, that if Israel keeps 4% uh, of the land, it yields 4% of the land. And that was not disputed for the first time by either leader. And uh, this is a creative mechanism that, in my view, will enable both sides to claim a major leap forward. Um, if I put it in sports terms, for those of you who follow football, and I'll translate for those of you who don't, uh, if we try to do it all and throw a Hail Mary, meaning a long pass, and just see who catches the ball, uh, we're going to throw an interception or an incomplete pass, and we might get sacked in the process, meaning we'll get tackled behind the line of scrimmage. <laughs> but uh, if it's all or nothing in the Middle East, it'll be nothing for sure. That's the way it's always been. If we try to throw a screen pass, a short pass, and run the ball 70 yards, I think uh, we could do a lot. Now, um, you, you know, that doesn't mean we score a touchdown. It's a long way, 100 yards, but we'll have moved this conflict significantly if we could deal with the land issue. And to me, when this issue is only four percentage points of difference, uh, I think this is amenable. Uh, and I went, when Senator Mitchell called me in, I use these sports metaphors. I'm not just using it at Brown. Uh, but I really believe that, that this is doable. I was, I was deeply touched that he announced publicly right before Thanksgiving that this is his goal now, is to do just the borders agreement. Uh, and I can say, well, how can you do borders and not solve Jerusalem and refugees? You have to have some sort of a timetable for addressing these other issues. But I think there are three advantages uh, for trying to tackle this one question. One, um, for the Palestinians, I think there's a way that they could get, like Sadat, 100% of the land. Um, and because they would, some of it, maybe four, up to 5% would be in these offsets, these land swaps land inside Israel that is adjacent and uh, contiguous to a Palestinian state. And uh, what's in it for Israel? Uh, well, you've got 300,000 settlers. Uh, but what most people don't know is that 240,000 of the 300,000 live in less than 5% of the land, largely adjacent, not exclusively so, to the Israeli <clears throat> urban areas. 
And so if there is this, uh, this land swap approach that's creative, these people who've been living in a legal limbo uh, for 40 years suddenly become part of the solution and not part of the problem. So instead of looking at the settlers as a monolith, look at it more as a heterogeneous situation that they could be split from each other and that you tell 80% of them you're part of the solution. Your, your, your position is not with the, uh, you know, with the rejectionist. What's in it for America? What's in it for America is that the settlement issue has been a flashpoint in different levels of intensity in U.S.-Israel relations over 40 years. And once you demarcate a border, um, then there's no more settlements. The settlement issue becomes moot because if they're within the line, they're not a settlement. They're Israel. Uh, so I think this would get rid of a major irritant in U.S.-Israel relations. You would have to have certain baseline understandings uh, in East Jerusalem that you don't expand into each other's neighborhoods. Uh, you know, so by deferring an issue as a Palestinian, you're not conceding an issue. Uh, I think that these issues are do deal doable. I think that any agreement should also deal with the issues of identity, that this is a state um, for the Palestinian people, a homeland for the Palestinian people, this new state of Palestine, and for Israel as a homeland for a nation state of the Jewish people, but with equal rights for all its citizens. Have you solved it all? No. But you could make a quantum leap in addressing this conflict. And I think we've seen the differences are bridgeable if there is the proper focus. But if it's all or nothing, it'll all unravel. And, um, actually, since I've started doing these talks with David, I've started watching football. I'm not <laughs> sure I fully understand that. But <laughs> I'm not sure I get it yet. But, uh, <laughs> look, um, there's good news here and there's bad news. Um, the good news is we actually know what the end game is going to look like, uh, more or less, in the peace process, uh, which was not the case. I mean, whatever, when I was a negotiator back in the 90s, we would come to the room with the Israelis and we would throw some ideas just to see if it's even within the realm of the possible. And equally, the Israelis would do that. We were still defining the boundaries of what is doable. After the Camp David and all of these things, uh, books were written, things were leaked, whatever. Now we know the end game. David mentioned what, the, what it's going to be on territory. On Jerusalem, it's going to be a divided Jerusalem, a Palestinian Jerusalem and a, an Israeli Jerusalem, and that's the bitter pill that Israelis will have to swallow. And on refugees, there are going to be no uh, return of Palestinian refugees to their homes in Israel. And that's what the Palestinians will have to uh, contend with. Um, the problem, the, that's the good news. The bad news is, uh, as we were saying for the last half hour, it's really the politics is not maybe is not ripe for that. We don't know. The problem with, or the issue, I mean, with the approach that David uh, presented is not, I mean, I actually think there is a lot of merit to it. But like many things in politics, like most things in politics, it's a question of framing. I think no Palestinian leader is willing to enter a negotiation that at the beginning says we're only going to be talking about uh, borders because they'll be accused that they're selling out in Jerusalem or on uh, refugees, etc., etc. And equally, interestingly enough, this is where Palestinians and Israelis are united against David. The Israelis are not particularly keen on moving on that one either because they feel if we give up land, we don't have any bargaining chips for the other things. Now, this is as an opening position. So neither side, I think, can get into a negotiation that only talks about borders. However, if you look at the way that the, board, that the negotiations are going to be structured, and this is, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's, uh, this is what the Palestinians Israelis, and Americans are talking about right now as we speak, is they will have an agenda that will start talking about uh, territory, security, and uh, settlements. Will it, when we get to a point where they agree on that, that might be the point to start presenting this. Okay, we've reached this. Do we have to wait for everything, or do we uh, present this now and continue negotiating? I think it's a, an idea that's very much has a lot of merit and has a lot of traction. The question is, how do you frame it in a way that does not kill it before it's born? Because in the Middle East, like so many other places, so many good ideas get destroyed because they were issued at the wrong time. They were released at the wrong time. It's a question of framing, but ultimately I think it will be very unfortunate if we hold peace because we can't agree on one point or another, and I think we are at a point where we cannot wait. Whatever we get, we have to start working on. And to be honest, what the Palestinians are doing on the ground in terms of the state building and institution building will make the territorial aspect that David talked about more real, more tangible, and in many ways more doable and uh, more realistic than some of the more symbolic issues. 
Okay, let me just ask one final question, and that is, what is the danger that violence will once again break out? How close are we to that possibility, whether it's uh, fighting between Israel and Lebanon, Israel and, and Gaza, possibly a third intifada? Um, are we at a point where, where we're, we're close enough that if we don't do something now, it's just going to start all over again? How much leeway do we have? How much time do we have before uh, the, next, uh, the next violence uh, breaks out? Look, we, look, we don't know, uh, you know, we don't have crystal balls. It's hard to say with any certainty. But if, let's look at the last two intifadas as, as two different models. In 1987, you know, you could say it was very combustible. There was a car accident in Gaza that just took on its own life. I would say it was a time of, of ultimate despair because there was no hope. There was all this effort by King Hussein of Jordan and Yasser Arafat to talk about a confederation this kind of diplomatic arrangement that fell through, and there was no hope of talks at that point. It was just utter despair. What Intifada broke out in 2000 was the, the opposite bookend, so to speak, which was that you had gone to the mountaintop, uh, literally at Camp David, and it failed. So there was this belief that you tried to solve the whole conflict, and when you tried something ambitious and it just collapsed, then the people thought, well, there's nothing to be lost but violence. Now, maybe it was less calculating on, on both ends, but it's interesting that those seem to me the two paradigms of either utter despair or dashed hopes. Where we are now is somewhere in the middle, uh, which is that we're finally in a process as of this week. Uh, it can't go on indefinitely, obviously, and I do think the United States um, will, uh, at a certain point, if you, know, you reach, you talk about an American role, you know, if the parties have come towards each other, but they need a bridge, I think the US, uh, you, know, I, you know, Wraith has heard me say this before, I think you could bridge over a river. It's very hard to bridge over an ocean. So, you know, I don't know any bridges over ocean. So, I mean, basically, the parties have to come as close as they can. And then the U.S. could put forward that final bridging proposal. But the U.S. cannot be a substitute for negotiations. It can only supplement negotiations. And I think Palestinians who thought that, that Barack Obama would, like deus ex machina, you know, impose a solution, have been very disappointed. That's not what the administration is at. It's not looking for these low probability scenarios when it's got a lot of uh, conflicts going on domestically and foreign and wants to husband its uh, political capital, so to speak. So I do think the U.S. would play a role, um, and so the talks don't meander indefinitely. The U.S. will be engaged, will be probing. And here I think Mitchell was actually will be at his best, frankly, more as a negotiator than as a strategist. And, uh, and really, I think, um, but if, you know, t if hopes are built up again and they're dashed, you know, I fear a third intifada. I don't see it now, uh, but I, those are the two models of what we've seen in the past. So um, I think I, my hope is with people seeing that there's now a, like a pathway with talks resuming, my sense is it doesn't happen now, but if the talks collapse and uh, there's no hope again, or there's dashed hopes, then those prospects uh, for violence uh, tragically increase. But maybe Wraith thinks differently. I actually don't. Um, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, before I get to the question, I would just comment on uh, the one point that David raised regarding American ideas. And as a Palestinian, I would you know, advise my former colleagues in the Palestinian Authority to be careful what you wish for. Because American ideas on the table will not be to the Palestinians' liking right now. What the Palestinian Americans would say on, Jeru on the refugees and possibly on Jerusalem will not fit with the Palestinian views. And it's one thing to say no to, the United to Israel. It's another thing to say no to the United States. When the time is right, there might be a space for American ideas, but it's too early for now. And it might actually lead to an early collapse of a process that might lead somewhere. Mm -hmm. But as to the issue of violence, there are actually you talked about three different scenarios. One scenario is uh, the question of Hezbollah. And in my view, this is very closely tied with Iran. If we are moving towards uh, war with Iran, then it's inevitable that the conflict with Hezbollah will happen either as a preemptive move by Israel, which is a more likely scenario, or you know, neutralize Hezbollah before you uh, deal with Iran, 
or uh, as a reaction from uh, Hezbollah to that war. This is, this is very tied in, but absent that, I just, uh, by the way, if this scenario happens, Syria, I believe, would be involved in this war. Mm -hmm. um, absent that, I don't see Hezbollah having the appetite right now for another war. I don't see Lebanon having the appetite for another war, and I think Hezbollah would pay a huge political price if it's seen as instigating another war. So that's on the northern front. Gaza is also very much linked up with, uh, Hama with Iran in a different way. Um, I think ultimately, uh, and this is going to be a test for Hamas, but I think Hamas is too dependent on Iran that if Iran feels that it's threatened, it will mobilize uh, has, uh, Hamas as a proxy. That is, in my view, one of the reasons why we need to stabilize the security situation in Gaza as soon as possible. If we manage to get uh, prior, you know, Corporal Shalit, who's an uh, Israeli soldier who is held captive by Hamas, if we can get him released, then I believe that on the back of this, we have to have a formalized ceasefire that will increase the price for Hamas to engage in another war. So this is the southern front, which leaves us with the issue of a third intifada. And here I tend to agree with uh, David. After 10 years of active conflict, Palestinians have no appetite whatsoever for uh, more violence. They've seen how damaging it is to their cause, to their uh, all of these issues. But also, as David said, there is a sense of, pro of movement right now, partly with the peace process. And I must say, the peace process, the credibility is very low. So that's not a determining factor. I see a lot of uh, traction and interest and excitement about what the prime minister, what the Palestinian government is doing in Palestine for Palestinians, whether the law and order and security work or the budding uh, economic uh, growth or the work to reform and create a responsive uh, governance. But this is, as again, as David said, this is not sustainable without a political horizon. People will be excited about building the institution of a state as long as they believe that ultimately there's going to be a state. If we get to a point of a failure of the peace process, then this might collapse. And I'm not here quoting myself. I'm quoting General Keith Dayton, who is the American three-star who is working with the Palestinians on this, who said, you know, two, three years. I mean, I don't like to give time limits, but uh, if there's a time that there's a sense that the peace process is going nowhere, and all of this uh, state building is simply beautifying the occupation, then this is going to collapse. Then the security, uh, Palestinian security officers will stop looking at what they're doing as a national interest and will start looking at it as collaboration. This will lead us to a third intifada. But we are nowhere near that because I think there is a sense that people want to see progress. People are tired of the violence that they had to live over the years. And to be honest, people, I mean, you know, it's easy to say that People are still feeling the injustice or what have you, but people are there are like any other people. They're interested in the future for themselves, for their children, and I think they're looking more for stability than they are looking for uh, violence and conflict. Can I just add yeah, just one, yeah. one word on the, to echo something that uh, Wraith said, which is that the Iran factor, I think, is, is a wild card in all this. I, I do think if Iran is successful in getting nuclear weapons, uh, you will see the moderates being intimidated and the rejectionists feeling emboldened. And I think, uh, you know, you could kiss goodbye any hopes for Middle East peace. So while it seems far away uh, from the action, uh, given also their support of Iran to Hezbollah and Hamas through arms, through money, uh, I do think that that is a wild card uh, that you have to analyze. And on, uh, also on the, on the top down, bottom up, I think you're hearing the same thing from Wraith and myself, which is that uh, you know, we're all excited about this new experiment of bottom-up, but, but bottom-up alone it won't be sustainable. It won't be sustainable because, as Wraith pointed out, Palestinian security cooperation, if people say we're doing this for a state and it becomes a mirage after two or three years, so you'll lose that. And also the Israelis will be suspicious that if it's unilateral uh, institution building, it somehow comes at their expense. So there's no shortcuts here for a negotiated outcome. And that is, you need top-down negotiations and you need bottom-up institution building. I see them going hand in hand, not one at the expense of the other. Okay, now it's the time of, uh, for those who'd like to ask from the audience. We have two microphones. So if you can line up, we'll try to take as many as we can, going back and forth between the two microphones. That would encourage as well further kinds of activities um, on both sides to pursue illegal actions in the idea that eventually the yeah. international community will favorably? <coughs> it's a very fair question. Um, I would argue, <coughs> excuse me, that the whole idea of a land swap is that, you know, if you're going to take, you're going to have to give. And that's why I'm, I'm for a one-for-one -one swap that 
which is not yet American policy, but that makes clear that there's a kind of a price uh, that it's not you, you just take. It's got to be balanced that it's even. That if I'm a Palestinian, I'd like to know that I got what Anwar Sadat got, 100% of the land. I think that the um, a border's first approach, I mean, George Mitchell thought that he could solve everything, he said, uh, Charlie Rose, within two years. He made sound like the borders, he might be able even to do in nine months. I don't see at this point that it would uh, create incentives for all these uh, wildcat situations. I mean, the borders are kind of, the, the contours are kind of known. But the fact that there will be a price that for every percentage point you have to give. I mean, I know in Congress had a thing called pay go, which I don't think they've actually enforced, <laughs> which is you want to do more spending, you got to find the revenue. And I think that there has to be somewhat of an equilibrium. Uh, I think the fact that, that, in my view, again, this is not the, the view of the U.S. government uh, yet, and is not the view of the Israeli government, but I think the, uh, you want to get a sense that there's dignity for both sides. If a Palestinian could say, I got 100% of the land, and the Israelis could say, I got 80% of the settlers, and to most people that sounds totally contradictory, but I'm saying those are reconcilable goals once you look at the maps. And uh, if the parties come through with different ideas, I'll be publishing these maps uh, this spring. I've been working on it. Where does demography meet geography in the West Bank? I think these things are reconcilable, and there will be a clear price uh, in, in, in any demarcation. Just a couple of additional points. I mean, first of all, this, this is a fair question, and that's a question that those of us who are negotiators are always thinking in these terms. I mean, you know, uh, how it affects its reality. I tend to agree with uh, David because not only are we talking one-to-one -one in terms of quantity, but one-to-one, -one, I wouldn't say totally in terms of quality, but uh, it was clear, for example, in Camp David, when the idea was first floated, the Israeli team uh, suggested uh, giving some uh, desert land in exchange for some good fertile land, <laughs> and it was seen as unacceptable. So Israel knows that if it takes land, it's going to have to pay Precious land, not kind of just uh, surplus stuff. My <laughs> concern is not that, uh, and what I would be watching for, is not as we move forward the settlement activity will increase, but as we move closer to a deal, you will see extremists on both sides being uh, more motivated to use violence to scuttle the agreement. And that is actually what one should start uh, watching for, and this is what both sides have to start today, with American support and American engagement saying, how do we deal with these uh, inevitable scenarios? How do we increase political, uh, I mean, military and security cooperation? And how do we come up with messaging strategies to deal with these kind of uh, issues? One last point on legal and illegal. I mean, law of, obviously have its place in the conflict, but I'm always cautious to make sure that law does not become a stumbling block to uh, resolving the, uh, the conflict. Yes, settlements are illegal, but at the end of the day, I could care less about the law as long as uh, when, when people's lives are in uh, place. But what you asked is exactly the kind of issue that negotiators struggle with every day. Thanks. Um, towards the end of your guys' talk, you emphasized the importance of um, <coughs> securing the situation in Gaza, not only for Israel's sake, but for greater regional security interests. And I was just want wondering um, what parties you think would be responsible for doing this, what kind of actions would be taken, and is there any... Um, positive hope that we can have for the future of Gaza? Or is it going to continue to be just a training ground for Hamas and, you know, um, you know, a, a place where mm -hmm. radical Islam, uh, Islamic, Islamism can fester? If I, may. I mean, uh, the first point in Gaza is, as much as I think it was clear in my presentation, I'm all for isolating Hamas. I think what's very unfortunate is that the Gaza population, civilian population, is being punished as Hamas is being uh, isolated. The initial uh, concept was let's uh, isolate, let's uh, have a siege around Gaza, and the people realize that it's Hamas, that's its fault, and they will rise up against Hamas. That's not how it works. These kinds of boycotts ultimately end up empowering those in power, and that's exactly what happened with Hamas. It's stronger, it has more control and weakening uh, the public. And in Gaza, what we're seeing right now is a collapse of the middle class and the private sector, which, if you're ever going to see opposition to Hamas, is going to come from those sectors. It's not going to come from an impoverished, downtrodden population. So there has to be a degree of separation. And I think the way to do it is to start 
opening up some reconstruction work in Gaza, opening up some uh, ability to move goods in and out of Gaza, outside Hamas's control. Now, who's going to provide security uh, for Gaza? Ultimately, as long as Hamas is in power, it is Hamas's responsibility to make sure that there is no, sec- no security breaches coming out of Gaza. And if Hamas, and Hamas has to know that if it uh, violates that, there's a very heavy political price, not only political, a military price that they are going to have to uh, say. And I think there has to be a situation of deterrence where Hamas is in its in interest, it's in, its in its own interest to maintain uh, stability and not use violence as it did in the last Gaza war as a way of trying to gain more sympathy. And unfortunately, in the last war, Israel was too trigger happy and Hamas was more than happy to uh, play up the civilian casualties for its own to gain uh, sympathy. So I think we have to create a deterrent situation and at the same time try to start separating the Gaza uh, civilians, the population from Hamas and while we continue to squeeze Hamas. Uh, can I just say, uh, if you've, you know, this evening I think you'd see that uh, Rafe and I are in agreement on probably about 99% of the issues. Gaza might be an issue where we have a, a slight disagreement. I mean, I, I of course agree with the principle, like, hey, you want a humanitarian uh, solution there? Uh, you want to, you know, kind of reinvigorate the middle class that has been really decimated? Um, the question is, how do you do this in a way that a credit doesn't accrue politically to Hamas. I mean, people on university campuses tend to think like Hamas is 10 feet tall. But the fact is that Hamas consistently is running 20% behind in Palestinian polls, like of Khalil Shakaki of Ramallah, the Palestine survey research. The only time that it, 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 it spiked up was in sympathy right after Castle the Gaza war. And that then disappeared, and now they're below where they were before the start of the war. So, you know, uh, we both agree on isolating Hamas because they are, uh, you know, they are a situation that uh, it under, you know, it cuts the legs out from under the moderates. I mean, why, you know, be, how could you be, if you're a killer and be kosher, you know, what about the guy who stuck his neck out for a two-state solution? Then he looks like a quizzling, or she looks like a quizzling. And then there's the regional dimension. In Washington, people think that it's all about power, but I tend to think uh, Hamas has ideological attachments. Uh, they're a chapter of the Muslim Brotherhood. I don't think they accept Israel the size of a telephone booth on a Tel Aviv beach. And Jewish history tends to be when your enemy says they want to kill you, you've got to listen pretty carefully to that, because they usually mean what they say. So there's, there's serious security dimensions to that. So the question is, how do you, in a, in a humanitarian sense, improve things, which you want to do, without, you know, without changing the equation? And you know, that's not easy. You've got now for the Egyptians now waking up in a way that they haven't, because there was a sense they were colluding and looking the other eye for a variety of reasons. Now no one says they are, and I think that's a good sign. Uh, but how do you maintain the sense that the credit goes to the Palestinian Authority? I mean, could you open up the Karni and uh, Erez, which are Israeli crossing points, as opposed to Rafa, which is an Egyptian crossing point, in a way that the PA gets the credit? Or do they look like Quislings, that they are kind of operating at the sufferance of Israel, and it's kind of one big Potemkin village because there's a Hamas checkpoint 50 yards down the road? So how do you do that? Uh, Clearly, if you could get reconstruction material in, in a way, that doesn't, it doesn't allow Hamas to divert it for bombs uh, or, you know, or missiles, that's a good thing. How do you ensure that? I haven't seen a good plan. I think we would agree on the objectives, but I'm not sure we agree on how to get there. But I think you know, we got to think about it and, and how to do that, because I do think there's a humanitarian dimension. I mean, I asked uh, the New York Times reporter who lives in Gaza, I just said, you know, living there, she said, look, you know, the, the stores are fully stocked. There's no homeless people. Uh, Hamas gave away a lot of the Fatah homes uh, after 2007. Uh, she said, don't worry about that. But still, you don't want a middle class that has been decimated. And we've got to think, how do you do this in a careful way that helps to this baseline agreement on not expanding neighborhoods into the other? whether it's the Gilo into Beit Safafa or into Walaja or something like this, 
you need that. And I think those things are attainable. And that will cool things down in, I think, an important way. I don't think it's, it's though, at the same time practical to ask Israel, you know, don't build a, you know, a, a balcony in French Hill or something like that. It just, I don't think that's practical. But I think there, there are common sense things you can do that can make a big difference. And I think I, I understand Palestinian concerns, and I, I, therefore I, I would like to see some sort of baseline agreement reached. If I may just, I just add one dimension. Um, excuse me. Um, I mean, Jerusalem is a powder keg in this whole thing. Jerusalem is where I can see things most likely explode. David talked about one side of it, is making sure that there is no changes to the uh, basic nature of Jerusalem. But there's another dimension that also we have to keep an eye on which is the dimension to make sure that none of the extremist groups actually uh, use Jerusalem as a way of exploding the uh, conflict. Any incident in Jerusalem, in the Holy House of Jerusalem, will turn this from a political conflict that is difficult but solvable into a religious conflict that is unsolvable. And it's so easy. And uh, right now, every Friday is a potential uh, disaster. So <coughs> things have to be done to deal with the kind of security situation uh, in uh, Jerusalem. This goes back to the point that, I mean, you know, while we both agree that, I think we both agree that the U.S. should not get too involved in the substance of the negotiations, I believe the U.S. should get very involved in creating a code of conduct for the two parties. Things that can be done and cannot be done, and when things are, that cannot be done are done by the parties, a political price tag has to be attached. And I think Jerusalem should be at the center of this code of conduct. It has to be clear what can and what cannot be done, but also what price you pay as a Palestinian or an Israeli when you break, break that uh, code of conduct. But Jerusalem is, if things go out of hand in Jerusalem, then you're talking regional, you're talking religious. Please, sir. Where does Saudi Arabia and Egypt fit into the situation and what pressure or influence can they have on both sides? I would say on, on you know, these, it's a very good question. These are the two countries that see themselves as leaders of the Arab world. Uh, in the case of Egypt, I think there's been more progress because of, of Gaza, as I was trying to say before, where I think they and the Israelis are actually working much closer together than ever, um, and that's good. But I think what's missing here is, you know, we hear sometimes about an Arab peace initiative, but very much in an abstraction, which is, what do you want? The Arab states, we, we have an Arab peace initiative of 2002. And, you know, I want to be respectful and say, well, it's better than not having it, and it, you know it's good that they did it. Uh, better late than never, but I would say that it's not realistic to have what I would call a completely backloaded Arab peace initiative. Just like it would be realistic to have a completely front-loaded initiative. What do I mean by that? The way it's currently framed. And by the way, if you talk to Arab foreign ministers privately with no cameras, they'll agree with you. But the way it's structured goes like this. Israel, you get out of the West Bank. You get out of East Jerusalem. You get out of the Golan Heights. When you do all that, send us a letter. We'll send, we'll send you a flag, OK? Now, for them to normalize relations is a big deal. So I'm not trying to be disrespectful. But it's never going to work this way. It's, it's not serious to, to operationalize. And nor would it be serious to say the, Israeli, the Arab country should open up an embassy tomorrow morning in Israel. They won't. And, and so what you need to do, it's a very simple formula. Every step that the Israelis take towards the Palestinians, the Arab state should take towards Israel. That's all. And if the Israelis take a step here in these Mitchell talks that is significant and is deemed by the U.S. and the parties to be significant, the Arab states should take a parallel step. A backloaded approach will ensure that it will never happen. It will be kind of over the rainbow. Uh, and it won't be real. Uh, so it's got to be parallel steps. That's what they could do. They're not doing it. And I think it's, you know, it's tragic. Uh, it's easier for Saud al-Faisal to kind of, you know, or Prince Turki to, to write op-eds in the New York Times, you know, uh, against Israel, when in fact the approach should be on how do we reinforce the foundations of peace. And uh, they could do much more. And uh, I'm, I'm sad that they do not. In addition to what David said also, they have a role to play vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian Authority yeah. in, uh, on two levels. Absolutely. One level is political, to ensure that they give the political uh, depth, if you wish, to uh, Palestinian positions and compromises. Ultimately, when the Palestinians have to make a decision on Jerusalem, it has to uh, have the kosher stamp from the Arab world and uh, things of this sort. So you need that for, the, uh, for that political depth, but also 
especially Saudi and the Gulf, they have to be more, more consistent in their assistance in the institution building uh, project. They should uh, continue giving financial support to the Palestinian Authority in regard of building the uh, institutions, of course, in a transfer, you know, transparent, accountable way. These are the ways that the Arab world can be extremely helpful in this process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I uh, thank you, first of all, for your talks. Um, I, I couldn't agree more that it's more productive to study political behavior by looking at political circumstances than intentions. And when you discussed uh, Abbas and Netanyahu, that's exactly what you did. But when it came to Hamas, it seemed that many of the comments focused more on intentions. And so I'm wondering, can we assume then that you're arguing that they are not responsive to political incentives and constraints, um, or are they responsive to them, and if so, which kinds? And, um, and then the follow-up question is, can you really have a peace process that's going to be effective while isolating Hamas, which seems to be the strategy you're both advocating, uh, especially considering that you're describing it as a spoiler? Right. Um, I, I would say the Hamas political calculus I mean, Hamas is a political player, and uh, ideology plays uh, a role in every political players, uh, including Hamas. But Hamas, if I want to look at their uh, political objectives, or their political calculus, rather, I would say Hamas right now is in charge of Gaza. They have the, uh, control over territory and population, which, you know, uh, Polisai 101, this is power. They're the first Islamist, the first Muslim Brotherhood organization to have that. And they know they can't be dislodged from there in any simple ways, not militarily and not uh, democratically. There's going to be no election. So for them, the calculus right now is there's not willing to give up in any way on the power they hold in Gaza. And this is what the Egyptians realized after rounds and rounds of trying to do the national unity talks. So that's one part of it. So in that regard, they're willing to have a national unity talk that preserves their control over Gaza and gives them a foothold in the West Bank, which frankly is an non-starter. So that's one, one bit of political behavior that we've seen in the Egyptian-sponsored uh, talks. In terms of their actions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Israel, they have proven over and over to be very, I would say, calculating about that. When they see it's in their political interest to escalate with uh, Israel, they do it. And frankly, if you look at what triggered uh, the last war, it was Hamas's uh, missiles into Israel that they knew what was going to come out of that. But they had their political calculus for that. Um, when they see it's in their interest to calm it down, they do that. The problem with Hamas is that decision-making has, there are three different uh, trends of decision making. You have the Damascus leadership, which is totally under the thumb of uh, Syria and Iran, and acts on their uh, instructions. You have the military wing of Hamas, which is an ideologically motivated wing that, frankly, these are the people who want to die and go to heaven, and they have to be dealt with in security ways. And you have the political players in Gaza, who at, right now are at the bottom of the totem pole. Um, this is uh, the situation. Now, one can imagine a situation where they will have an interest in joining the process. But at the end of the day, you, they cannot get the benefit of political mainstreaming, international mainstreaming, without pay, paying the admission club, the admission price to the international club. And that's recognizing a two-state solution and giving up on violence. Can we have a peace process without Hamas? Absolutely. At the end of the day, the PLO is the, uh, in international law and international relations terms, is the party uh, that is entitled to uh, speak for the Palestinian people as an international entity. You can sign a deal with that, that uh, with the PLO that covers Gaza and the West Bank. Then the issue of Gaza, of Hamas and uh, Fatah and Gaza and the West Bank becomes a domestic Palestinian issue. And Hamas then will have to make a choice because once Hamas, as long as Hamas is in charge of Gaza, you cannot implement in Gaza, you can implement in the West Bank. And Hamas will have to go to its public and say and explain why it is a stumbling block towards building a Palestinian state in Gaza itself. You change the political calculus of Hamas and the political tools. You remove the tool of violence, the utility of violence, and they have to then contend with their role as a stumbling block towards statehood. As a spoiler, that's exactly what I said earlier on, that we have to develop mechanisms and tools that are both security and political and messaging, public relay, uh, you know, PR, public diplomacy, to deal with the inevitable violence, because that's where you will see Hamas uh, playing the role of the spoiler. That's what they've always done. But there are ways. Look at the South African experience and other experiences. There are ways of containing violence and containing the political implication of violence. And this is what we have to start devising from now on. I would just say on, on the Hamas uh, thing quickly that, um, look, I, you know, Mubarak uh, has, uh, I've been told, it says this too, uh, there's very tense times between Syria and Egypt. And he said, look, if the issue of Hamas was just local Hamas, 
I think it might be solvable. But with Iran and Syria putting veto power, there's no hope. Um, so I think there's a power dimension to this of these parties from the outside, and I alluded to that with the Iranian uh, issue in the, uh, beforehand. I, I also think that um, there's a question, do you spoil from the outside or do you spoil from the inside? You know, whenever I hear Hamas say, you want to, you want to send a unit government? Well, you have to agree to something called the prisoner's document. It's an obscure document, but it basically says it's not about peace. It's about a ceasefire That's and, uh, you know, that under very limited terms. And it doesn't give us any hope uh, bringing them in. I mean, I'll be blunt and say that, I, you know, I'm not sure that Jerusalem and refugees, um, you know, that Abbas has the power right now to make accommodation. Not only haven't they conditioned the landscape, I think if he won a victory on, on the borders, uh, he might be better positioned vis-a-vis uh, -vis Hamas because people would see that the negotiations paradigm has been vindicated. Um, but I, I see no evidence, not a shred, that you know, Hamas is only about power and that if they only give it a piece of the pie that you know, they could be co-opted. I, 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 don't, I don't really see that uh, at, uh, at this time. So both of you guys talked about kind of the main divisive issues, but I think another part of the issues is the economic inequality between Palestine and Israel and how in the future does a peace agreement really tackle that issue, like what is the economic cooperation going to be after a peace, as well as how do you prevent Palestine from becoming a failed state? Mm. I mean, I, when I started uh, my role as a negotiator, I used to think of the negotiations as uh, you know, a marriage. We have to find uh, us and the Israelis a good marriage where we have to be warm and loving and what have you. Over the years, I look at it now as a divorce. Um, <laughs> how do we get, how do we deal with the very basic issues that uh, define the conflict, and these are territory, security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and let the other rest of the issues, including economy, for the future. Now, in terms of economy, there are two views in Palestine, at least two views. One that sees Palestine as part of the East, that wants Palestine to be another Egypt, Tunisia, you name it, uh, Syria, that kind of model of uh, governance and political and economic uh, systems. And there are those of us who look at it as part of the West, and as such we look at Israel as uh, a gateway to the West. This is though a domestic Palestinian uh, issue and a conflict. And I think what Fayyad is doing right now in terms of the institution building and uh, building an economic situation is exactly to make sure that once you have a state, it's not a failed state. You put the foundations now, and if we're lucky, we can put actually sound foundations that would put us in the kind of prosperous part of the world, not in the backwards part of the world. Uh, this, but this is a domestic struggle, and I see that if we and the Israelis negotiate it right now, it's gonna become another bargaining chip. Uh, we have too many bargaining chips as it is right now on the table. Please. Well, you've given us both reason for hope and reason for grave concern uh, tonight. And I think this relates not only to the Middle East, but also to all of us in this country, in the future, not only of the Middle East, but of the whole world. So could you address that a little bit more as far as how the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and whether or not it gets resolved uh, will affect uh, not only the Middle East, but the whole global situation. And I'm thinking about uh, the U.S. relation with uh, Al-Qaeda and actually the whole Arab world. And how does religion play into that? And it feels to me like one of the reasons that this is so impossible is that people on both sides are saying that our holy books say that we absolutely can't give up this land or these holy sites. So how do you ever get beyond that? <laughs> I would Two say, very big questions. I, I would maybe I'll, I'll start on this. Yeah. Look, I you know there's a tendency to think, um, and Dennis Ross and I in our book on you know address this issue of linkage that if you somehow deal with this conflict, you can unlock all the other conflicts and maladies of the Middle East. I think you know Americans have had somewhat of a seminar in the Middle East since 9/11. We see how complicated it is. The sectarian differences in Iraq will not disappear. You know, Iran may still seek a nuclear weapon, even if there is a conflict, you know, even if there is a resolution. So to look at this as the kind of the open sesame, you know, magical solution to everything, I think is clearly uh, wrong. It won't happen. 
But I will say we do see that this issue is evocative in the region. And, uh, and, and therefore, it is one layer of anti-Americanism is that this is somehow used as a bludgeon uh, against the United States. Uh, I mean, Al-Qaeda, if you take um, Osama bin Laden, he's a Johnny-come-lately, so to speak, uh, to this issue. He never cared about the Palestinian cause. He exploits it. So maybe he'll be taking a card out of his hand, so to speak, but that doesn't mean the end of al-Qaeda or the end of extremist terrorism or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to be somewhat modest in, in what we think we could achieve. Is this a layer of anti-Americanism that's, that's used, that's exploited against the U.S.? Yes. Should you try to take the card out from them? Yes. But will it unlock other conflicts and end terrorism? No. Um, so I think it's a little bit of a, of a mixed picture. But I, I do want to say, because you talked about as Americans, and I don't know how much time we have, uh, but I, it's actually, if, you may, if it's okay with you, I'd like to also address Americans as, you know, campuses too. And I'm not, you know, I don't go to school here. I, I, um, I used to visit here when I was a college student a lot, but, uh, but so I don't claim to be an expert about your campus here. But I do think one of the reasons why Wraith and I are doing this, A, we, we do want to see a peaceful resolution of this conflict. And we think that if the people only knew that the differences are much narrower than they thought, maybe it would lower the temperature on college campuses. I mean, we see a situation that historically the campuses are usually ahead of the curve. And that, you know, Washington is running to catch up with progressive thought on campuses. And we're not trying to be disrespectful to anyone here in this audience. But what, we, what really saddens him, uh, both of us, is that we think on this one issue, the campuses are way behind the curve. That they're retrogressive, that they're polarizing, that they finger point at each other. And it's ridiculous to us that Israelis and Palestinians are sitting together in the Mideast, but in the Northeast, they can't sit together. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to us. We don't get it. You know, and we're always looking for the wisdom from the campuses. And we say, here, there's no wisdom. And what we're coming for is a plea, I would say, for moderation. I mean, to us, it was very heartwarming uh, when we were out at the University of California at Santa Barbara or University of Chicago uh, of getting Hillel students and Muslim students to sit together, their leadership. And there was a recently a, a conflict on something at Santa Barbara. And the very students who started to sit together this fall they help put down the conflict because they had dialogue between them. I'm not saying dialogue solves everything, but it's just to us, this polarization of believing that you're actually emulating the Mideast and the Northeast, A, you're not, because the Mideast is ahead of you, and you're behind them, so wake up. And, and again, I don't want to be disrespectful, but our point is once students realize the differences are not that great, they should be able to come together and bring Together, they could produce more light and less heat. Um, so I just wanted to ask a little bit more, if we could address a little bit more Iran as a hot button issue and sort of um, how, the complex situ how the complex relationship between Iran and Hamas influences um, not just the conflict, but in terms of, it seems that Iran might be a hot button issue that could actually push the peace process forward because of how like mm -hmm. a lot, Israel and Palestine are actually right next to each other and any nuclear weapon that Iran was gonna use to obliterate Israel would also obliterate Palestine and maybe parts of Egypt or Jordan. It's a really tiny yeah. place, smaller than New Jersey for some people who don't know. So it's so funny, it's such a big issue in such a tiny place. It's like you would think it's half the world. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, Iran, I mean, Iran is a game changer. Iran and Hamas is a very complex relation because on the one hand, Iran is a big supporter of Hamas. On the other hand, Hamas cannot be seen as being too close to Iran because Iran are Shia and Hamas are Sunnah. And this creates a legitimacy deficit for Hamas. So it's a very interesting dynamic they have there. And that's why Syria is so relevant because Syria is the buffer. Iranian money comes to Syria, it gets uh, laundered through Sunni stuff and goes to uh, Hamas. So it's a very interesting uh, triangle here. But the, in terms of Hamas, of Iran, I think it presents an opportunity 
not only because, we've, frankly, most of uh, the region couldn't care less if the Palestinians disappear and the Israelis disappear, they would look at it as a headache out, but more in terms of uh, Iran now represents a common threat, not only to Israel, but to Israel and uh, some of the Arab states, particularly the Gulf states, particularly Saudi Arabia and Egypt. So suddenly, what you have is a clear intersection of interest. When we were talking about security uh, concerns back in the 90s, we were talking about Iraq and Saddam being a security concern. That was mainly an Israeli security concern. Right now, we're talking about Iran. And it's a common security concern. And I think this can create a moment where the Arabs and the Israelis can come together, push for resolving this uh, conflict, because resolving this conflict besides the symbolic value, will also allow Arabs in, uh, to work openly with Israel on military cooperation. So it can create that kind of uh, moment through creating this intersection of uh, interests. So in that regard, I think uh, Iran can be a game changer. On the other hand, as uh, David said, a nuclear Iran is also a game changer, but in a different direction. Okay, I'm gonna um, just really, at this, in this portion, just have two more questions, one from Sammy, one from Alicia. Um, those who would like to continue in the smaller group setting are welcome um, uh, after we have these two questions in, in McMillan 115. So Sammy, please. Um, both of you has given me uh, quite a bit of hope tonight. Thank you very much, um, especially about a uh, two-state solution, which is a solution that I would like to see materialize with, and a solution that I want to pursue and work for. Um, but at the same time, when I think about peace and about solution, I also think about failure. And I want to know what is the price of failure from your own perspective. And if you can give me some hope on that, that would be great. I would be the happiest uh, guy tonight. Um, you know, and, and my question is coming from the idea that if we fail, does that mean that I, as a 20-year-old Palestinian, have to live under occupation for I don't know how many years down the road? And does that mean that we're going to see more violence like an intifada or like an Operation Cast Lead in Gaza? I would say, um, look, the stakes of failure are high because I think if there's failure, you'll hear more people talking about one state solution, which I would urge you to realize is not a solution. And read the book of uh, Wraith's colleague, uh, Hussein Ibish of the American Task Force for Palestine on this. Uh, there is no it. it it's, uh, if you look at demographic trends, uh, it's, you know, it's really a call for the destruction of Israel because they are more, uh, the Palestinians are winning a battle of the bedroom. So more people would say, why negotiate over two states? Let's just wait 20 years and uh, it'll just happen that way. Well, Israel's not just going to turn over the keys, so to speak. So I think this is, it'll be constant conflict. Maybe there'll be a situation that in 20 years or something, the Israelis might pull out settlements and it would just be a military uh, occupation or something like that. But frankly, the more the settlers are there uh, and there's no hope of peace, people say, well, why pull out? So I don't know if that will even happen either. So it's, it's a bleak situation where, you know, I think Hamas is waiting in the wings to say the moderates have failed, let's pounce, because uh, we could discredit the moderates. And I think on the Israeli side, uh, too, uh, there will be these demographic challenges, and that's why I know every, there's a, a view in certain academic circles, it's all about American pressure. I, I've, I've not accepted it. I got asked that by Senator Lugar when I testified at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on Thursday, and I said, I don't think it's all about external pressure. I do think there are these domestic driving forces that say, what if it fails? Then what? Then you have a, a, a very bleak situation where Hamas is waiting in the wings uh, and you have uh, the demographic challenges uh, on the other side. So I don't, I, I, that's why Wraith and I are very passionate about a two-state solution. We want to be raging moderates uh, on that regard and uh, because we do think a lot is at stake. I mean, I, I can't give you hope in case of failure. It's, uh, I would even, I mean, in, in some senses, what uh, David uh, drew is one scenario, and that's not the bleakest. For me, a failure of the two-state solution and the paradigm of a two-state solution will mean the failure of organized poly Palestinian polity. What you will do is you'll have the Palestinian polity disintegrate. You will end up in a situation of chaos. 
Um, Israel, the one-state solution, unlike what some of the uh, advocates say, is not inevitable. If Israel feels a demographic, demographic threat, there's an option. You build the wall, and you uh, pull out, and this becomes a Jordanian problem. It's not preferred option for Israel, not preferred option for anyone, but it's an option. Israel would rather get into another war than accept the one-state solution, because that will destroy Israel uh, by other means. So for me, a collapse of the two-state solution is a collapse of organized Palestinian political identity. And with the collapse of political identities of this sort, this is an open space for Salafists, Jihadists, Qaeda, you name it. Uh, it is going to be messy. This will turn, and this is going to be, back to your point that you raised, this is also going to invite a whole slew of religious uh, symbolisms and players and what have you, and really turn it from something political that we can handle, something religious that is simply unhandleable. First of all, I wanted to thank you and thank everyone. Um, this has been really wonderful. Um, I'm obvious, sorry, this is a little short for me. Um, I'm obvious older brother for those of you who don't know um, and just wanted to thank you for this. And I have a question. I uh, don't know if it's worthy to be the last question, but I'll try. Um, you've talked a lot about the political uh, actors, the states, the uh, politicians, and uh, touched a little bit on the civilian populations on the uh, college campuses in the U.S. Uh, and you've also mentioned on, on several occasions, I think, that uh, the political leaders have not conditioned their populations to accept peace. My question is, is it possible to, to uh, condition those populations from within? And how could, could that be done? How should that be done? And then. On, on the converse, what should happen within the civilian population internationally in the U.S. and other places to help that along as much as possible? Want to start this? <laughs> Let me, look, I, you know, I like I said, I'm in awe of what your brother and uh, you know Sammy try to start here. Um, that's what needs to happen. Is there has to be enough reasonable people on both sides. Uh, that remind everyone else what are the stakes of failing and, and what are the opportunities for success. Um, I, you know, sometimes I wonder, I, I'm just thinking out loud and I, and I admit I don't have a grand uh, idea in mind. If there was somehow a joint birthright uh, idea of Jewish and Arab Americans going together uh, to the Middle East, to try to build some bridges. Um, Birthright, for those of you who don't know, is a program where college students get to go to, to Israel. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and many, you know, uh, I don't know, 100, uh, uh, over 150,000 or something have something, done it. Something like you know, maybe we have to think programmatically of ideas where instead of people pointing fingers and uh, having uh, training in an adversarial context, they actually go over there to help build bridges uh, for a better future. And I don't know if that means working together on the environment, on uh, alternative spring breaks, or things like this. I, I don't know. I admit I'm not an expert on uh, campus programming. We got to put our heads together and think, how do we build constituencies that, you know, that would actually bring people together rather than tear them apart? I mean, I mean there was in the 90s an attempt to do a people-to-people -people, uh, program. And it was very artificial and very superficial. And when the peace process failed, that all of that, most of, not all of it, but most of it kind of disappeared. Which, if I want to take a lesson from that, there will be two lessons. Any cross-border cooperation has to be founded on a solid ground, not on slogans. When people are uh, together because of slogans, once the slogans fail, people uh, go away from uh, one another. You need to build a more solid ground. And to be honest, if I look at what's happening in the security sector in terms of soldier to soldier, working together on a common, a common objectives as professionals with the professional pride coming in, this is the one kind of model I would like to see. I would like to see this replicated on the various uh, levels, be it uh, governmental, security, private sector, uh, municipal, cooperation based on interest. Because at the end of the day, interest trumps any uh, goodwill and what have you, and it, uh, it tends to outlast emotions. In terms of what one do can do Domestically, between the two sides, I think this is a real challenge. The bilateral is secondary to the internal. The whole peace process would not have happened had not there been a peace camp in Israel that developed organically in Israel. It's over now. 
that peace camp is over, that has to be uh, rebuilt. And that's an internal Israeli uh, matter, equally on the Palestinian side. We have to start working on developing these internally, and that's not uh, easy. One, I mean, if I look on the Palestinian side, and I look again at what Fayyad is doing, in addition to building the foundations of a future political uh, Palestinian state that's not a failed state, he's also building a constituency that has a stake in the, a real stake, a day-to-day -day stake, a concrete stake in the success of the peace process, and who will have something to lose if the peace process uh, falters. So we have to start building these, starting to find what are the real interests and how can we uh, build on the real interests. In the meantime, what do we want from here? What do the Palestinians and the Israelis want from here? They want messaging. They want a dynamic that uh, validates the positive reaction, the positive uh, trends that might happen there. They don't want something to uh, detract from it. In that sense, what I see on campuses, I mean, look, David and I and many others in Palestine and Israel do not agree on everything. And that's fine. People disagree. That's fine. But what bothers me most is when the dynamic becomes a dynamic of, uh, of delegitimization. When the message that is getting to the general public, to the campuses, and back to the region is, we are all engaged in a process of delegitimization. Apartheid week this, uh, Israel criminal state that. This will, ha this will get us nowhere. At the end of the day, what we need is responsible people on the campuses and outside the campuses saying we are an agent for change. We are an agent that's sending positive messaging, saying that we disagree, but we can disagree uh, honorably and with a degree of respect. And I think this is, this is what this stands for. This is the fact that all the organizations came together to organize this stands for. This is what Avi and uh, Sami did. This is what we needed uh, from them. And let things in the region grow organically. Organically and based on a solid concept of interest and self-interest. Thank you. Thank you very much for teaching us so much.